guys, welcome to uh, another Visual Insights. Uh, glad you guys can make it again. Uh, for the ones who have not made it before, my name is Ryan Harrison. I train visual performance skills for the last 20 years on a variety of different athletes from uh, a lot of baseball to softball to track and field. Not, well, I have worked track and field, but tennis, uh, hockey, football, uh, car racers, pretty much anything that has a visual demand, we work on the visual skills for it. Uh, I've been lucky because I learned from the best who my father, Dr. Bill Harrison. Uh, Dr. Bill uh, started in 1971 with the Kansas City Royals and um, was kind of considered the, the godfather of sports vision for many years, especially in baseball. And early on, uh, he had um, a couple dads who wanted to figure out how he could work with their sons. And uh, one of them was Sean Green early on. And the other is the Giambis, uh, Jason and Jeremy Giambi. And uh, so we got Jeremy on today. So I'm happy to have Jeremy on here. We've known Jeremy for, I don't know how many years it's been Jeremy, but it's been a long time on there. And um, once you, most people know a little bit of your background, but you know, obviously you and your brother came up in uh, collegiate baseball, uh, played in the uh, Upland area and then um, played professionally. Why don't you give everyone a little background uh, of your baseball career? Yeah, so I think it all started, uh, obviously, I can go through some of the stuff. I was an Inland Empire guy, Southern California, yes, in the uh, uh, Upland, West Covina area. We went to South Hills High School, um, played a lot of sports, played three sports. I was a football, basketball, and baseball guy. Um, didn't have a lot of individualized sport at that time. A lot of us kind of were encouraged to play multiple sports. Obviously, in today's game, that has changed. They've kind of focused on, you know, what's your best path? What should you do? And try to get the best tools available to, to accomplish your dreams and goals. So on from there, I went to Cal State Fullerton. Um, uh, hitting back on, on high school, we did win a, a CIF championship in 92, which was uh, kind of exciting at that age. Got a chance to play in Anaheim Stadium, step on a major league stadium, um, and then to win on top of it was great. Fullerton, um, starting my career, uh, college career there. Um, Jason went to Long Beach, so we had kind of that you know, Cal State, Fullerton, Long Beach State, rivalry going on, and uh, um, great experience there. Some of the some of the best coaches in college baseball. We had uh, Augie Garrido, who was our coach, uh, George Horton, uh, Rick Vanderhoek, who is now the head coach there. Uh, those were uh, uh, Rick was my assistant at the time. So, you know, great baseball tradition. Learn how to play the game. Learn how learn the fundamentals of the game, and try to improve your craft. Um, we ended up winning a national championship there in uh, Fullerton in 95, uh, beat uh, USC, which was kind of exciting because growing up, we were big USC fans. Didn't get to go there, but it was kind of bittersweet to, uh, you know, take home the national championship against, uh, you know, a place I kind of wanted to go. So um, on from there, uh, got drafted by the Royals in 96 and uh, – Got, got through the minors pretty quick, was minor league player of the year, had a wonderful year uh, the next year in AAA, uh, was rookie of the year in the uh, Pacific Coast League, hit 374 that year, um, 20 homers, RBIs, and, you know, it was just, uh, you know, the opportunity was there being a small market team, having, having, the, having the ability to, you know, kind of get through the ranks pretty quickly. Um, on from there that year, I got called up in September and that kind of started my journey in the major leagues, um, having some injury problems, uh, wasn't able to play the first half of that next year, but going on from there, you know, it, I ran out with the Royals and they had some prospects, got traded to Oakland dream come true. Um, played a couple years with my brother. So that was, uh, obviously something fun and, and having him around um, on from there, got traded to Philly, got trade, then got traded to Boston and uh, ended up kind of career ending with the Dodgers uh, when I herniated my disc. Yeah. So great career. Like I said, got a chance to play for a couple different teams and uh, 
you know, uh, great experience. Yeah, you definitely had a lot of experiences. And even going back into the college, um, you know, being at Fullerton, uh, Cal State Fullerton, which obviously a lot of people know that that program was phenomenal back then. Um, and you're around some really, really good coaches uh, that have proven them over time. And, and actually, you know, even going back to my dad, you know, he, he was, did some stuff at Cal State Fullerton back in the um, early, God, I don't know, early 80s maybe or something like that. I don't remember when those years were. But, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe talk a little bit uh, about how at Fullerton, um, how, how, you know, how did you go from going to college to Fullerton to getting to that next level? What was some of the things at Fullerton that helped you get to that next level? Well, obviously, you know, we, we tried to do everything we could in the game, whether it was physical, whether it was mental, whether it was visual. And I think at that time, um, we had met your father at the time and, and we had an opportunity. Um, I know he had, he had worked with many major leaguers, like you've said, and we felt like it was something that we needed to include you know, as part of our training. And yes, it's training. The eyes, the visual, the visualization, it's training. And we felt it would hopefully, you know, take us to that next level and be able to keep improving on our craft. And so, like I said, we went down and, and saw Dr. Bill Harrison and started to become part of, you know, the journey with him and, and the utilization of the stuff um, that, that he had at the time. And obviously that you guys have now, um, you know, anything from depth perception to some of the other things, um, and we can get more in depth in it, but. Yeah. But you know, that, you know, one thing that you guys did that, that was, uh, tremendous at the time is you guys learned something from him. And it must have made sense to you because you stuck with it. And it was even stuff that you guys did. You know, you got away from it like everyone does. But every year I know you guys came and you and it was like a reset. You would see him, make sure your eyes were right. But you would also get uh, – he'd give you a little uh, uh, hair and a shave, you know, on, on how the vision worked. It would always remind you how to get back and start your spring training and start your season off to be a highly – no, absolutely. I, I think, like I said, the, the vision, whether it is hitting, whether it is your focus, anything, your vision tells you everything. You know, when you really think about it, it tells you when you're at bat. It tells you when to start your load. It tells you when to go from big to small focus. It, it tells you everything by – tracking the ball by understanding where the ball is. It's telling your, your eyes are telling your brain what your body to do. So obviously if you were going to put something, you know, on importance, it's the most important thing. It starts what is your body's sequence to where you're trying to get to and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's a, it's a great way you say it. And, you know, I say it all the time, so it's always good to hear from other people. But, you know, as a player and, and going up into the pros and the minors and, and the big league, do you find guys, uh, and, and I know some of the answer to this, but, um, you know, that don't have a very, I mean, what you're talking about is a visual plan. So do you find guys that don't have a very good visual plan at a lower level compared to a high level or even guys, um, you, you know, that had a lot of talent and if they had that visual plan, plan it might have taken them to another level well and I I think those are some of the things um, that a player has to look at and say how can I improve my game you know because yes we can improve by getting bigger stronger faster we can improve by taking cut swing analysis all these different things but there's other ways to get better at this game too mental approach visual approach, visual plan. What am I trying to do? I know a lot of things I do now. I teach young hitters. When you're hitting off a tee, take a visual approach to it. Yeah, the ball's sitting there. Take a visual approach to when you're working off a tee, like a guy's pitching up uh, out there. Use your mind. Use your eyes. Visualize the ball coming 
to you at a speed. Visualize the ball breaking to that spot that the tee has you. Add these different things to not only improve your eyes, your mind awareness, kind of how it all, you know, works together. Do these things because they are working. They do work. And trust me, I've been there and done it. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a, it's a good point. And we talk about this a lot in some of these shows is a lot of mindless hitting that's going on on the tee or, or even in, in the batting cage. And instead of being mindful and, and having that plan and really, you know, incorporating the, the neural pathways of the vision, mind, and the body. And, you know, it's, it, you bring up, yeah, well, guys need to get stronger. They, they need to swing. They're, they need to work on some mechanical things. But to me, the, those, those are gross things. Those are big things that have little gains, which are important. And the little things like vision and mental breathing, all those, you know, seeing visualization, those are little things that have huge gains to a lot of these players. And, and, you know, you bring up that visualization, how important was visualization to you and maybe even your brother, but, uh, but more about you to your game? Well, like I said, you know, and, and not to sound um, cliche about, I don't even know if that's the right word, but it did take me to the next level. And, you know, all of us have a certain of athletic ability. All of us have a certain, um, max at how strong we can get, how fast we can get. But when you talk about the eyes, you're still talking about a muscle that can get stronger. You're still talking about being able to do little things that can make you that much better. They might be that something that you're missing or not putting a big enough emphasis on where, you know, you minimize it saying, oh, I see the ball, hit the ball. Well, are you or are you not? Like I talk a, a lot of different things, training off the tee, training. What are you seeing? Are you seeing the ball or are you seeing a particular spot you hit on the ball? Are you trying to incorporate what your eyes are telling your body to do? And are you executing it? You know, and that's just some of those things. When you do things, do them with a purpose. Do everything. It's not about quantity. It's about quality and gaining the type of feeling and seeing what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, we were talking about this a little bit prior to getting on live here, but, you know, it, it, everything you're talking about is, is, is key components that, that most people miss. They don't, it, it's not sexy. It's not something that they, they, they work on. And, you know, it's always been a challenge of my dad's, even myself, but is how do, how do we get this word out more to more players to understand that this is a huge game. This is the things that, that are difference makers. Um, you know, not the, not what everyone else is doing, but difference makers to make those players more consistent. Well, and, and I think, you know, that, like you said, it's not sexy. This is the tedious work. And, and the mental toughness and mental focus to overcome that I'd have to do this. You know, like a lot of the stuff we do, we don't want to do because we minimize it. But when you're talking about, yes, proven data, proven results, why wouldn't you do it? You know, that's the question you need to ask yourself. Find, it's like anything, find the time, find the right people, get to the right people, do your research and understand that this could not only be the missing component, but how far can it take me and how much better can it make me? Yeah. And that's, you know, the thing about hitting, throwing, fielding, pitching, all these different, you know, even other sports, you know, there, there's so many uh, different little you know, I don't know, maybe say bubbles, you know, of things that need to, to be trained to make ourselves a better athlete. And understanding those bubbles is, is, is the key, is key to go, is this something that's going to take me to another level? Or do I need to get stronger before I get my vision? Or do I need to get my vision before I get stronger? Do I, and, and I'm not saying one goes over the other, but, but I think athletes think, uh, these young athletes think it's just, oh, if I work hard, and, and not smart, but just, you know, I, I'm just going to swing, swing, swing. They're going to get there. 
but there's so much more to this game than just swing. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's the importance of having the complete package. You know, how do I maximize each individual category and get the most out of myself? You know, and that's what it's about. Like you said, I don't know which one's more important or not. Obviously, your eyes hit the ball, your mind and all that. And yes, strength and these different things are just as important. But it's about how do I make me the complete package to give me the best opportunity, not only to where I want to get, but even when I get there, how do I make myself better? Now now that that idea that you talk about is that and I, and I think I know the answer but just uh, for conversation here did you have that drive did you have that desire back in high school college minor league um you know when did you figure out you know and I know you met my dad in college but um that to work on every little thing was important to your game yeah you know I think it was instilled in both my brother and myself through my father you know, and, and I think he was kind of like always looking for how could we make him better? How could, yeah, Jeremy has his talent. Jason has his talent. You know, they all have their own thing. But how can I give each one of them something that, you know, will improve them on top of just growing up and maturing and getting bigger and stronger and hitting? Because we did a lot of it. But like I said, you're always looking for something that can get you to the next level also. And like you've said before, the eyes see everything. You know, looking back on all that, I probably should have spent more time on. <laughs> yeah, I, I always laugh because, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of players out there and coaches and, and um, parents that all say, hey, where were you when I was playing? Because, you know, I, I would have used you. And I laugh because the reality is it was there. It just, you didn't put it, people didn't put it as the importance. And, you know, guys that, that get through your career, just like you, you look back and you go, God, that, you know, I did stuff, but man, that was a huge role and, and a difference maker of guys that have very good vision, visual skills and visual plans um, that go to that next level. And part of it is, you know, and I, I'm going to ask this as a question to you, when you struggled, when you had tough times, what was, what were going on? What was going on in your mind? Because your skill sets don't change, but what goes on in your mind when you're struggling? Well, I think looking back and and trying to analyze it the best I could was we get out of the process, we get out of the we get out of the stuff we're supposed to do and focus on the result. The result it is something that happens from the process. And I think a lot of times we get so focused on result. And yes, this is a stat oriented game. It is a result oriented game, but a result happens because of the process that gives us the ability to have success. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we, you get caught up in a lot of the, you know, whatever the, the results, because, you know, whatever the manager, the coach, the GM, the fans, all these different distractions that happen and you get away from your process of seeing the ball really well <laughs> and putting a good swing on it. And it's, I wish it was easier. Um, and some guys can make it a little bit easier, but I think if you can really, you know, step back and learn that process and go, what does it take for me to be successful at this task? And, and you put it in good terms is you got to see the ball. And you got to have a good mindset and you got to put a good swing on it. But if you don't see that ball well, that swing's not going to be as, as good as or efficient as it needs to be. So you got to find a way. And I know you guys did this. And I kind of mentioned this as you, you know, either talk to my dad or dad would send you a message or you would come see him and would remind you, Hey, Jeremy, see the ball like you're damn capable of and allow your athleticism to work. No, absolutely. I, like you said, it was either a text message and, and he was there for us. And I think it was a journey of, of utilizing the, the people we had that were in our lives, in our career to do that. And so as, as I look at things today, 
we have these things available. Why are we not using them? You know, we have the ability to go have hitting coaches. We have the ability to find pitching coaches. We have the ability to find string trainers. Why don't we want to train the most important thing in our game as breaking it down to as simplistic as seeing the ball, hitting the ball? Why don't we do that? I, I wish I could answer that question because <laughs> it's the chat. This the million dollar question I've been working on for years, and and you know even you know it, it it's not even you know you bring up the process and all that stuff, but even the fact and I do this with the college programs. It's amazing that thirty to forty percent of those college programs have a visual clarity deficiency, and that was one thing you guys and there's other guys too that they want to make sure that they are eyes are as good as they can be before they go and go into competition and you know it amazes me that more people aren't having those vision exams aren't getting the clarity or aren't putting contacts on or aren't making it an important part of their their routine to get prepared for baseball well i i think you hit on it it's some of it's the awareness and it's funny because a lot of times some of my kids go to the optometrist and because we'll be seeing something and I'll, and I'll say, Hey, look at that over there, that wall. And they're like, I can't read it. And I'll be, what do you mean you can't read it? And I'll be like, have you ever had your eyes checked or have you gone to somebody who specializes in this? You realize you are trying to see something at a high rate of speed that very, that has a variation of not only, uh, path to the to the plate but also speeds and it's funny how sometimes that's it where that takes them to a next level as simple as having context to see the ball because I don't think they understand how they should see the ball I know me we got into so you know specific things my vision was just a little off in the clarity I would wear a very minor contact one a days, only when I played, but it created that sharpness in the ball. I was able to see rotation better. I was able to see seams and it gave me the ability to once again, get better. Yeah. And, and your vision was good enough, you know, walk down the street, go to the mall, you know, do whatever you needed to do. But when it came to that game time and you wanted to have the best weapon and you wanted that sharp as can be to be able to make, make decisions. And, and that's a key thing. And, you know, part of the problem with that is people don't know, kids don't know, like you said, how can I see that ball better? And, you know, I, I even laugh and, and I, I'm going to ask you this in a sec, Jeremy, but you know, there's some people in baseball coaches, um, you know, uh, whether they played or not played, and they'll say, guys can't see the ball like that. That's impossible. Um, you know, Bonds couldn't see the fingers on the ball. Um, you know, I hear people talk about that. And it's like, why would you put limits on anyone that they and, and question that they couldn't do it? They did it at the highest level. I'm not going to say they couldn't do it. I want to find out how they did do it and, and find a way to get there. And I know you and, and Jason and, and every other player, Sean Green too, in, in this case, had a different – kind of approach a different plan and that was one of the things you know I think that pride myself and my dad is we, we helped that plan for you we helped that plan for Jason we helped that plan for Sean we helped that plan for George Brett we helped that plan for you know whatever player that is to get the most out of their eyes but what in you what was some of the things that you found successful in your plan um, you know talking about looking for scenes and, and looking for balls what what's some of the things you did to try to get to do that well, I, I think it started with first the visualization of possibly going from big to small. Um, you know, the eyes focus better when they're not strained. So I was kind of a guy being left-handed. If I was facing a right-hander, it would kind of be kind of, I'm kind of looking out. Yeah, the picture's in, in the view, but – as he started getting down to his wind up and separation, I was getting back to where that release point was going to be because the eyes would, would focus and, 
and be at their best at that time. So that was the first part of the process. Now, I was able to sometimes pick up hands, pick up rotation pretty early. But I think you hit on the point is I don't know if we can all do it, but I do think when we're struggling sometimes, are we doing it? That's the question. You know, are we trying to see the ball as early as possible out of a pitcher's hands or are we not paying attention to it? So that comes back to that process. You know, we would text Doc and, hey, go back through your process. Are you, are you picking it up early enough or do you know you are? You know, so then I'd have to go through all those at-bats, go through all those pitches and say, huh, maybe I wasn't worried about it at that time. You got to get back in that focus, get back in that grind. It's just like a swing. You know, guys go through great times. Guys go through slumps. Why do we go through those slumps? Are we kind of, do we get generic or do we stick with the process? Did we, you know, start, you know, getting loose at the plate and just seeing the ball? Or do we go through that whole meticulous visual to mental to plan? Yeah, no, you're definitely right. And we're lazy humans and we get lazy. And it's not a fact matter of, I didn't see the ball, but I didn't see the ball like I'm capable of. And, and that's when, when you have a lot of that reflection, you kind of go back and go, okay, did I see it like I'm seeing it when I'm seeing it really well? Um, no, I did not. Okay, so let's go back to that process. What, what helps me get to seeing that ball well? And part of it, and correct me, you know, you're all different, but um, you know, part of it was the preparation. Part, part of it was watching the video. Uh, of who you're going to face part of it might have been and um you know the visualization process of the pregame visualization and and i remember this is, wasn't you but just because your brother i remember jason having an issue when he was in new york was the damn media wouldn't leave him alone where he couldn't have that time to visualize and get himself prepared and he had to find a new way to do it when he was in new york so you get those distractions that you know you, you may have gone through the steps but didn't put it in there but then you get to in the dugout to in the box to stepping in the box and then going, okay, I just got to see that ball really well. And then I'm going to just put a damn swing on it and let it fly. And you remember all those things, but I know all that stuff gets, gets away from you. But when you stepped in, and I guess I'm leading to this is, did you have a swing thought or did you have a vision thought that was dominant when you stepped in the box? Well, I mean, I think, when looking back on it, I think that varied because like I said, did we get comfortable? Did we not think about it? So I think at times, yes, it was a vision thought. And then sometimes it was a swing thought going back on it. You know, how could we, if I could have done it all over again, which would be perfect because I can, you know, uh, older and wiser. <laughs> yeah. Obviously I would have gone through the whole process when I was successful, stayed with it, tried to correct it quicker, tried to do all these things. So it all has a connect, kinetic chain of sequence that I think you need to put together that plan. Yes, but you don't want to overthink it too. You want to do a lot of these things in a training environment. You know, I tell these kids, I say, and I tell the older ones, I just don't have kids. I say, don't worry about where you hit the ball. I said, it doesn't count in the cage. Mm -hmm. Try to get a process to visualize. Try to get a process to complete the kinetic chain of your, your, your load, your separation, all these different things, because you can think about them off a tee. Then we go to the next process, short toss, all these things. Now the ball's moving. So it, it's, a, it's a process of not only taking it from the very most important thing, the visualization, then take it into, okay, how do I get that and translate it into as close to game situation as I can? And hopefully with all of that, it becomes not only muscle memory to doing it right, Hopefully in the game, we don't have to think about it as much because we just do it. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, it's Jeremy, it's funny. You're talking about like being wiser as we go through this, but 
um, you know, for me working with different teams, it, it's interesting. There are a lot of kids that have come to me that, that want to learn a lot from me in these minor league teams. And their dad might have played in the big leagues or their dad played in the minor leagues. And they all tell me, my dad keeps telling me, this is the most important part. He wants me to work hard, but this is the most important part. I need to learn the visual part of this game to take myself to another level. Now, on the opposite side, you get people who don't get that and don't understand or haven't been part of it. And they say, oh, no, you got to swing. You just got to swing. You just got to swing. And, you know, I, I wish in today's world not to, to beat this down, but especially with Twitter and stuff, there's so much about, you know, swing mechanics and so a little, such a little about visual or, and I don't, I don't want to just say visual approach, but it, a, a hitting approach, how to go and do it consistently because the best hitters are consistent and they have a plan. And I, I wish in today's world, we have more people understand that. Well, I, I, I think, I think some of the things it's easy to pinpoint saying you can't hit like that, you know, and I don't think, like you said, there's enough information. No, that's not correct. There is enough information, but we're not getting it out there and people understanding how important it is. You know, I think you, you, you said something and said, well, just swing. Look, everybody's different body type. Everybody is, has different mechanics. But I think I hit on it earlier. How do I make myself the best player? Okay. How do I make myself the best hitter? Well, everybody's going to be different. And people are going to, you know, do different things in the box. So this kind of hits on that visualization, having a plan. You know, if you have trouble, let's say, hitting the inside pitch, yeah. I'm going to try to give you those things of your weakness to try to hit the inside pitch better. But don't you think your plan and seeing and doing what your strengths are, you should stick to those things. Not to say you shouldn't work on your weaknesses, but if you're a guy that hits the ball middle, middle away, go up there and don't miss the middle, middle away pitch. Right. I mean, my brother always had a funny story. I was like, you know, you hit the curveball so well, you know, you stay back on it. And he goes, Jeremy, and he's kind of being funny. He goes, you know what? Yeah, you can learn how to hit the curveball. If you still have trouble, he goes, don't miss the fastball. You know, I mean, it was just as simplistic as that, right? But it comes back to that seeing and doing what you want to do, that plan, that visualization of that plan. You know, and you can achieve, you know, it's funny, this, this uh, pandemic we have and all these different things going on in the world, people want to make excuses. You know what? I've always grown up to never have excuses. You know what? You can do sit-ups. You can do push-ups. If you don't have any of that, you can go take dry swings. You can visualize dry drills. You can do all these things. Yeah, you don't have a cage in your backyard. Big deal. You know what? There's different things we can do. There's different things that we can get better at, even if we don't have things, right? Yeah. But like you've said, some of this stuff is out there. A lot of this stuff is out there. You guys are doing Zoom stuff. I mean, take advantage of it. You're home. You've got a lot of time. You know what? I started doing Pilates and yoga at home. I'm like, and I love it. Like, it's yeah. just something that I'm trying to, you know, improve myself even to this day. Well, I, I think, you know, you, you bring a good points there. And, you know, even talking about like the Latin market that never had anything and they figured things out. And part of it is doing stuff, you know, wh whether it's, uh, like I said, if you don't have a cage or you don't have a tee, you know, get, you know, little rocks, hit rocks, you know, or, um, you know, get some some pinto beans at the store and start hitting pinto beans. And, uh, you know, obviously we use, and I've talked about this, the wiffle ball machine with Max BP. We use that high velocity wiffle ball. We, we talked about that on the phone. You had the older version. Uh, we called it, it was called the challenger. That's no longer made. And uh, in fact, this is a good point to that. Um, to, you, you used to use that challenger indoors, I think, and hit indoors with that. Oh, absolutely. And I used to do it in the living room. <laughs> and I had a big enough livery room to swing in, but balls were bouncing off walls and everything else. But, you know, you hit on that important part is 
And I think some of us are doing vision training, even when they don't know they're doing vision training. Exactly. You know, you're playing wiffle ball in the backyard and, you know, these guys are throwing crazy curveballs at you're doing vision training. Yeah. You know, letting the ball come to you, seeing the ball, trying trying to figure out where where the hit point was going to be. You know, you're sometimes we do those things and don't even know it. So yeah. why don't you want to, you know, do those things? Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's the part of the fun part about it is, you know, it, look, if you're missing a ball, you got to figure it out. And you got to figure out by looking at it and making sure your brain's processing where that is. So that's where I think a lot of the, the small ball, the wiffle ball, the, the, the change and stuff is, you know, even like you bring up the curveball. Hey, that ball's moving. So what do I need to do? I need to track it better and allow my barrel to hit those things. And, you know, even, you know, my experience with the wiffle ball machine over many years is guys get frustrated. And instead of what you did, Jeremy, is you said, man, let's fire this up in the house and let's hit the heck out of this thing and figure it out. Ryan, great point. And I think it comes down to possible, oh, I'm in a cage and I'm swinging and missing or I'm at, I'm, I'm not being successful. But you are being successful. Do you understand what you're doing? Like, there's a lot of times I crank up my machine and I'll crank it up to 98, you know, 98, 100. Kids are not, kids are not, putting a ball in play, I say, don't change what you're doing. See the ball, try to figure out how you get the timing, but stay within, you know, your visualization, your mechanics and all that. And then all of a sudden I turn the machine down to 80, which they probably weren't hitting before. And they start putting them in play. So the, you're doing some things to your, what your eyes are seeing. Like you just hit on the high velocity, you know, wiffle ball, you're doing different things to train your mind, not that you might be successful at it, hopefully you get to that point, but you're still accomplishing some of the things you, you need to do. Yeah, you know, and that goes back, you even brought this up, as we get so result oriented and, well, I missed it, so I failed. Well, not necessarily. You, you may be learning something, you know, and, and we learn as much in failure, or we learn more in failure than we learn in the success. And so we have to be challenged. We have to, you know, change our parameters. We, you know, smaller bats, smaller balls, bigger balls, bigger bats, have, you know, people use heavier, whatever, is, is really learn to, hey, what does it take it for me to compete at, at, at this level and be successful? And I think, you know, for you um, and, and having your brother and you guys are what two years roughly in age four, four. four years in age okay um but there was a little you guys had a like a really good relationship but you also had a competitive relationship as well is that well, correct i think you hit on it is he didn't he didn't cut me any slack growing up so i was either going to go two ways i was either going to figure it out be competitive the best i could or i was going to quit and go home and I think that comes back to, you know, hitting on what you said. I think, you know, I tell a, a lot of the kids, the older kids, no matter what you do, your batting average didn't train, uh, change in your training. None of this changed because you don't get, you don't have a batting average in the cage. You are working on your craft. You're working on your game to improve when you go out there and it counts. You know, at the end of the day, why we think vision is so important is because the transition from practice to game is so hard. So how do I practice that if I don't, if I, if I don't do it in the game? How do I get better at it? Well, you've got to use your eyes. You've got to use your brain. You've got to train those things the way you need to to put yourself in position to be successful. Yeah, you know, it, it's a really good point too, again, is, you know, even you take baseball out of this, but let's say uh, driving a car, learning to drive a car, it, you're not gonna do it with a blindfold on and you're not gonna do it mindless. You really gotta be, where are my visual uh, anchors? What am I paying attention to? How I'm looking down the road and, and I'm going to do that and practice that before I take my test and before I get out on the road and do it. And hitters, I think, 
you know, players today, uh, and maybe players back then too, I, I shouldn't say just today, but sometimes they're working so hard in the cage, they, they never figure out, wait a minute, I, I'm not practicing for what the test is. I'm practicing just to swing. And the eyes are part of that test. And if that, and you said this right at the beginning, I say it again, if the eyes aren't getting the right information, it doesn't matter how fast the car is, doesn't matter how, how safe the car is. If my eyes aren't giving me the right information, I'm doomed for an accident right there. Well, and I think you hit on it. You know, they see when I take a swing off the tee, and of course I'm old now, and, and, but it takes me a 15 to 20 second process to take one swing where they might take five to 10. And very rarely do I get a question is, what are you doing? Usually I say, I'm trying, and then I'll talk them through what I'm doing to take that swing and prepare to take that swing off a tee. I'm setting my feet. I'm imagining my body being in the correct position. Then I'm imagining seeing the ball, feeling what I want to do. Then I incorporate the visualization and imagination. There's the pitcher winding up. What is my body doing when my eyes see him winding up in, in my mind? The next part is the separation. Am I starting my load? Am I starting my separation? The next thing is I see the hands break. I see the ball coming. What do, what do I need to do to be at my best to strike that ball perfectly? That's every swing I would take off a tee right now. Five or ten of those is better than a hundred not doing that. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, kind of changing back, uh, going back to pro ball for yourself. Um, you know, and you went you went through what five organizations? Is that right or four? Yeah, four. five. Um, and and obviously, I think the highlight, and you kind of mentioned this, was being able to play with your brother in Oakland. And um, I think that's a it's it's amazing. You know, when when family gets to do that, maybe um, you know. Help, help people, you know, I, I don't really have a big question here, but the thought is you and your brother playing in the big leagues together, the conversations that you guys had about hitting had, had to be phenomenal for anyone to listen to. Uh, maybe give us a, an insight of how those conversations went or what you guys talked about. Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, to pat myself on the back a little bit, he did have his best years when I was with him in Oakland. <laughs> but it, it probably helped. And, and like I said, we would sit there and talk about what did pitchers want to do to you after an at bat on the bench. Oh, what happened? You know, you got one, two, you battled, you know. Ah, oh, Jeremy, you know, I was, I was doing this. I was sitting this. And, I, you know, he threw me a good pitch or, you know, just talking through those things, you know, we can learn a lot about ourselves, about our game. How many of you take the time to go through and say, okay, I had four bats today. After the game, you know what? Maybe you're getting ready for bed, whenever. You know what? What pitches did I get? Did I take the pitch? Why did I take the pitch? Was I ready? Did I see the pitch? All these different things come into play or do you just go up there and swing if you hit it swing if you don't you know those are all those little things you know it's funny because I used to do that and maybe I did it too much but I felt it helped me my brother also he we talked big about you know learning from whether you had success or learning from failures because in our game it is a game of failures as a hitter but the key is the pitcher has, can beat you and you did everything right also. So, you know, it comes into that, well, what happened? Well, nothing. He threw a good pitch and I got beat. Like, you're three out of ten in this game and you're a Hall of Famer. You know, yeah. so you – and I think that's probably the hardest thing to accept is, is not understanding that you can line out four times in a game and be mad – and rightfully so. And you can go three for three and not hit a ball farther than 200 yards off the handle. I mean, 200 feet off the handle. I mean, it just really, it, it doesn't make sense, but 
It's about that mind and understanding what you're trying to do, just putting yourself in the right position to be successful. Yeah. At the end of the day, you might have put yourself in the, it, it, to be successful even when you get jammed. Hey, I saw it. He threw a great pitch. I reacted. I did the best to my ability to put it in play. And I, and I got rewarded, yeah. Yeah, well, I think, you know, obviously with your brother and, and stuff, it, it's kind of cool because, one, you guys had a good relationship, but, two, you guys wanted to help each other. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're discussing the game in a way of, like, not as a competitor, not as someone, you know, I want to be better than you. So you guys had this unique situation where you can sit there and go, what did that guy throw? How did he get you out? What were you looking for? What was your thought process? And it was such a, a, an advantageous situation to help each other. And on top of that, you also, and you probably some other players I don't know, but you also had a guy that was really helpful in Mark McGuire uh, in talking about what he sees and how he went about it. And he was a highly visual game or highly visual hitter as well. Yeah, you know, I, I think what we don't do enough is is some of the training to, to improve our vision. I think the specific training of our eyes, the sp specific training of getting ourselves in the right place, whether it's velocity, whether it's change of speed, whether it's change of pattern. And when I'm talking about pattern, a curveball, a slider, a split finger, a change up, a four-seamer, a two-seamer, you know, because we're hitting a round ball with a round bat. It is the hardest thing to do in sports. And guess what? We don't know where that pitcher is going to throw it. That's the hardest thing to do. So we have to learn how to train our eyes, train our mind, train our body to react in a split second to be on time or as close to on time as possible. Yeah, and that's where, you know, getting as much information is really good. Um, now, going back to your Fullerton days and uh, being around Augie Garrido um, and, uh, you know, a great, great coach and great experience, what were some of the things that maybe um, had a lasting impact of uh, his coaching style, which I, I know is not easy because, you know, playing for him, probably you didn't realize some of the good stuff he was doing. But, um, you know, what maybe some of the things you took from Cal State Fullerton uh, that, um, that you, you know, hold on to today? Yeah, I, I think what was really ingrained in, at, at Cal State Fullerton at that time was learning to play the game right, okay? And in the process of learning to play the game right, what did that involve? understanding what you were going to do at an at bat, trying to execute it defensively as a pitcher. How do you get through the process to try to minimize errors and have successes? And he truly believed that if we did that enough throughout a nine inning game, we should have success over the succeed over the season. You know, basically be better than the other team. That doesn't mean have the best hitters, but if we took the best at bats, if we grinded out, made smart pitches, not to say we don't make pitches and make errors, but over the long haul of the games, the series, the season, it was just a process of doing things right, doing things at the highest level to our ability which was different from everybody, if we were doing that as a team, we would, we would come out on top. That's awesome. I think, uh, Jeremy, we're going to wrap a few things up. If people have questions, you know, please put them in the chat room and we'll get, try to get to them. But, um, you know, a lot of the things you said, obviously, you know, hits me really hard because it's the stuff we talk about and, you know, stuff we're pushing and trying to get guys to understand. And, you know, we, we talk about it from a player standpoint, but we do have some parents and we have coaches online right now. What are, you know, maybe what's, what's some advice that you would give to the coaches to maybe, uh, you know, encourage this visual plan or anything else? Well, I, I think they need to understand what visualization does for you. It 
starts the process of what your body's going to do, what your mind and is going to tell your body to do. How do I train myself? How do I incorporate what I'm seeing, whether it's high speed velocity, whether it's, you know, quick movements, whether it's quick movements, left, down, right, up, down, whether it's defensively, whether it's pitching. You've got to understand what vision does for you. It is the number one thing that we need in this game, and we have to do it at a high level. If if as simple as you have athletes playing together as a unit, they can only be so good. And what I'm saying is, not to say they can't get better, but athletic ability only goes so far. How do we do different things and utilize the other aspects of this game? And it starts with the eyes. Cool. And uh, one last thing for me, Jeremy, but, uh, you know, maybe uh, what are you up to these days? What's going on with you? Well, um, obviously, uh, I am at PFA in Claremont, and I'm doing private hitting lessons. Um, I do go do and do team lessons. Um, we've incorporated some rap Soto. I know I've reached out to you. Um, obviously I want to come down there and, and see the great stuff you got going on. Um, I would like to try to incorporate some of that with my younger kids and older kids. I don't think there's any time, you know, to start than when you're young, but that doesn't mean if you're in high school or you're in college, you can't, or even in minor leagues or major leagues, you can't start it there. That might be the something that might take you, make you a little bit better, you know? And so all those things, I'm always trying to not only improve my craft, but by improving my craft, by passing on to the next generation, all the things I did do, all the things I didn't do, Looking back, which ones do I think were the most important? Which are the most stuff that I can kind of pass along to the next generation and hopefully make it the best? Yeah, I think that's a great opportunity for either players or coaches because, you know, you, you did it. You lived it. You, you had success. You had failure. And, you know, learning from players is, is a great go about improving your game. And I, not that – if you didn't play, you don't know anything. But I think of putting the the, the combination of the two um, together, whatever it is, it's just – it's a resource, you know. And so I think players and coaches would be um, – I don't want to be rude, but not smart to be able to pick brains of, of former players and former coaches on there. Um, I do have one other question from someone. Uh, what did Jeremy uh, – what did you do on defense to see the ball off the bat? So once again, it was a similar approach – it was kind of having a, a vague visualization of an area. Then I tried to focus on in the timing of from the pitcher to the hitter. So my visualization being in left field, I would kind of have a, 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 a visualization of the pitcher as the ball continued to go to home plate. I would then focus in on uh, the batter and hopefully pick up Just like as a hitter, you're trying to pick up on hands or spins. I'm trying to pick up on angles of the bat. So it was kind of the same process and doing it, you know, and and teaching yourself to doing it. When when I did a lot of this stuff, it was during BP. Could could I see the ball that a right-hander was pulling to me by a BP pitcher down to a bat? And what angle did that bat hit the ball to me? If he swung at this angle, did it cause a line drive? Did it cause the one line drive that goes over your head? Did it cause the hooking line drive? As to some of that particular, you know, specifics, I was always trying to do all those things, even on defense or even before the game, pregame. Yeah, that's, it's almost like cheating because, you know, you, you are giving yourself this visual plan of defensively, as well as offensively, of picking it, picking things up as early as possible to give you the most amount of time to make the most accurate decision on there. And why wouldn't you? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I say it, but why wouldn't you know? Why wouldn't these guys want to take advantage? And and it's it's awesome because you know, and I've been lucky enough to be around you. I've been lucky enough to be around a lot of pro guys 
And, you know, those guys do. They work on a method to slow it down and pick it up early so they can make that decision. Absolutely. Like, I, I couldn't have said it better. And, you know, it, it is available out there. You're doing it. You're trying to give them the best opportunity to be better, whether that is as simplistic as, you know what, you need to put on some contacts. I know that kind of – but or getting to the simple depth perception, the – the reaction, how do my eyes react? How do they tell my body what to do? All those different training methods, they're available. You know, and, and if I could give advice, take advantage of it. Looking back, I took advantage of it. And guess what? I hindsight's 2020. I probably should have done it twice as much. Yeah. I got a couple more questions popping in here and I'm not sure I'm Charlie, you might want to clarify this for me, but he says, does putting your shoulder into the pitch affect your hitting? Putting your shoulder into a pitch affect your hitting. I yeah. think your shoulder rotating in and out does affect your hitting. I think you want to try to stay as, as online and as parallel to the pitcher as you can. When you start rotating correct uh, acute acute angles it it kind of gets you in and out of the zone yeah and and just you know i may take a little different take because i'm thinking vision wise if the shoulder is coming in you might close your eyes off and on the up, opposite side if you're opening your shoulder you may be opening your eyes off so i personally look you know how do we get the eyes in the right place and then get them in a comfortable position um and then another question here do you teach your kids to slide like you did to slide like I did? Yeah. I guess slide step, maybe? I don't know. So, um, I don't know if they're talking about the slide in Oakland or, or what they're talking about. Who knows? Um, but maybe anyway. That's what, maybe that's what they're talking about. <laughs> maybe they're talking about the slide in Oakland. I don't, I don't know. You know what? When, when, when everybody realizes this, the game is about split-second decisions. Sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. You know what? We, we have to live with them whether we're successful or we fail. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, that, that's the damn truth. And, you know, we don't always make the right decisions all the time. And especially, um, you know, th there are things in place that, you know, just aren't supposed to happen and happen and just – the results aren't the way you wanted to be there, but you know, um, obviously every play you're trying to do your best and some of the decisions you make are right. And some of the decisions you make are wrong. And, um, sometimes the umpires are right. And sometimes the umpires are wrong too. So that's, yeah, that's and, quite the game. And, and, and like I said, it, it's something I can't change, but is it something I could do different? I don't know. At that time and place, I made the decision, you know what? The great, hopefully the great part about a game is the unknown. That's why we love sports. We don't know the outcome, even when it's a juggernaut versus an underdog, anything. As we, as you go through, you can get down to, why didn't I swing at that pitch? Why, why did I take, why did the quarterback throw it there? Well, and then there's big moments. And, it, you know, it's a lot easier to guess after, after the play than it is during the play. Absolutely, absolutely. In, in any sport, you know, or anything we do. And, uh, you know, if we, if we live our lives second guessing, we're in trouble. We just got to, we got to live with our decisions, like you said. And I think you did a great, great, uh, um, you know, uh, statement on that, Jeremy. And so I, I do appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, discussing some of your experiences and, and your, your, you know, hindsight as well as your you know in the game moment on there and lucky enough to uh you know have you and your brother and your dad at the time um, when i started with my dad 20 years ago i know you guys were a big part of what why i decided to keep pushing what his message on and and now it's our turn to uh your message and my message and 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 keep pushing that down the road and give people an opportunity absolutely and uh, i appreciate you guys for having me um, and Ryan, when we uh, get open back up, I, I do uh, would like to come down and, and, and see what's going on and, 
you know, try to incorporate not only with my hitters, but of course I'm always trying to get better too. So maybe yeah. we have some vision training for, uh, as we, as we hit, go over the hill. For the softball league. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, looking in the, the picture behind us, that's, you know, inside and uh, hopefully we'll get, we'll get in there soon and uh, get guys in there training, get you down the, since you're close on there. So, Again, appreciate you guys all for, uh, for joining us. Um, any questions or anything, please uh, send, send us an email. Uh, thanks, you know, Max BP for supporting us and sending some emails out and getting us out there. And um, we'll be on uh, tomorrow and I think Friday, and we've got a lot more shows coming down the road. So hopefully uh, you guys join us for some more information and, and uh, take this and, and run with it.